Welcome everyone. This is the uh, Wednesday, March 29th, 2023 meeting of the Minnesota Senate Transportation Committee. The time is about uh, eight minutes after three o'clock. We are in room 1100 of the Minnesota Senate building. Uh, members, uh, we have uh, one item in front of us today. That is the uh, uh, finance proposal for uh, our division or our committee. Um, and so uh, what we will do is um, we will hear the presentation um, of that in a walkthrough conducted by our nonpartisan council and fiscal staff. Um, and uh, then once uh, we're through that, uh, we'll uh, go to the committee for uh, questions um, to clarify any, any matters that, that folks have um, that I can respond to or staff can respond to. Um, and then, of course, on Friday, um, we will invite public testimony on the proposal, uh, and then on Monday, uh, we can have uh, uh, more questions, committee uh, conversation, and debate, and amendments. Um, so, uh, Senator Jasinski, how does that sound to you? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, other than having a Friday meeting, it sounds pretty good, but uh, <laughs> uh, it sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Very good. Um, and with that, we will await uh, we'll ask Senator Morrison to <laughs> take one. Just one just here. Senator Dibble, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I would like to start uh, simply by uh, moving the A1 amendment to Senate File 3157. Very good. Uh, the A1 author's amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. OK, the amendment is adopted. And thank you, Madam Chair. I don't think I will um, spend uh, a lot of time uh, framing up or giving context to the bill because I'd like, um, you know, all of that debate and, um, and uh, you know, sharing of our perspectives on the proposal to occur on Monday other than to say um, we've seen all the potholes uh, both on our local roads as well as our state trunk highway system. Uh, we are aware, of course, that uh, Metro Transit uh, has an uh, upcoming fiscal cliff. Um, continuing on the theme of transit, the suburban opt-outs have needs, and they brought forward proposals, and Greater Minnesota Transit has, has got a lot of gaps and needs. And so just, um, you know, I'm really, really proud of our state. Um, you know, it is the state with the, some say fourth, some say fifth largest roadway system in the country. Um, that's something to be really, really proud of. Uh, we have... We have had a, a good transit system uh, in years past. Um, it's lacking right now with a lot of service cuts and, of course, a lot of the conditions of, of insecurity and public safety on the transit system. Um, and we have this kind of, ex, this not kind of, this absolute existential opportunity and challenge in front of us in terms of our environment and the contributions that transportation makes to um, climate change. And so this bill, uh, aspires to address all of those issues. Um, we are in a time of declining revenue in all of the transportation supporting funds, whether that's you know, property tax can't meet the need for local roads, and then all the dedicated sources that flow through the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund um, uh, have, uh, have been on the decline or not rising, which is kind of a paradox in this moment of surplus federal funds and, you know, of course, we, we raise revenue at a time when, when family budgets are stretched. And so, um, so this bill is, you know, is, a, is a fairly strong uh, bullet step forward, but there is always a return on investment in transportation. So with that, I will conclude. And um, I will, let's ask um, our council and uh, fiscal staff to help us understand the proposal a little better. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And before Council does that, I just want to note that in accordance with the rules of the Senate, the following members will be participating remotely in today's hearing. Senator Port from Burnsville, Minnesota, and Senator Herr from St. Paul, Minnesota. And with that, I will defer to Council. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senators. Um, I'm going to walk through, rather than walk through the language of Article 1, I'm going to walk through the spreadsheet, which has all the appropriations in Article 1. Um, and I'll try to be as brief as I can. Uh, I just want to orient you to the spreadsheet first. Um, it's arranged by agency um, and then uh, division and, um, and separate budget areas. And then the, what we'll be looking at is the Senate columns, which is on the far right. In the middle are the governor's recommendations for comparison, but we're just going to walk through the Senate pieces, and I'm just going to highlight the change items and not talk about the base amounts too much. So for instance, on lines 12 and 13, you'll see the base amounts for aeronautics, and then uh, the lines underneath in each section will be the change items. So on line 17 is the first change item. Um, this is part of a governor's rec package to uh, meet the match requirements for the federal IIJA infrastructure money. Uh, and there'll be a number of these throughout the spreadsheet. I'll just point them out that all, I believe all of the governor's recs were picked up on this on this issue. So that is 26 million one time from the general fund for aeronautics for the IJA. Line 18 um, was a governor's rec to pay, for, uh, to pay for aeronautic systems and investments one time with general fund and the Senate has picked up that item but paid for it out of the state airports fund on line 19. Uh, next, moving to aviation support and services under aeronautics, um, line 29 is part of an overall governor's rec to maintain current service levels at the agencies, and this is to pay for things um, like step increases, benefit increases, things like that, so just to, to bring all the, the um, funding of the agency as it is up to, up to level, I suppose. So line 29 is part of that, and that's from the general fund for aeronautics. Um, and then on line 31, that's another governor's rec, that's $7 million one time to replace two utility aircraft at the department. Moving down to Greater Minnesota Transit, the change items start on line 43. Um, and again, a governor's rec, uh, part of that maintaining current service levels in this area. And the next line 44 is some one-time money, $68 million from the general fund as part of the IIJA match for um, uh, formula and discretionary grant funds. Uh, line 45 and 46 are appropriations for some transportation management organizations. Line 45 is ongoing funding for the I-494 Quarter Commission. Line 46 um, uh, was from a bill that funded uh, transportation management organizations in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and a newly one to be established in southeast Minnesota, and that's some ongoing funding there. Line 47 is a statutory appropriation um, for active transportation grants. Um, and that money is going to be transferred from the general fund into the active transportation account and appropriated to the commissioner for grants in that area. Page two, there's a change item under safe routes to school. There's one-time funding in 24 and 25 on line 54 of 10 million each year, and then an increase to the base by 1 million um, starting in 26. So the total for safe routes every year would be 1.5 million from the general fund. Line 61 is a change under passenger rail. This is um, ongoing uh, operations funding for the Twin Cities, Milwaukee, Chicago rail corridor. Uh, the funding in the last budget bill um, funded a second train on that rail corridor and this will be operating money and that's general fund ongoing. Line 62 is a one-time appropriation from the general fund of 50 million for the Northern Lights Express uh, rail corridor. Let's see, uh, then we'll move to freight and rail safety and there's a number of just uh, little pieces of the GovRex here on maintaining current service levels. Freight and rail safety is funded by both general fund and trunk highway money, so there's pieces from both of those on 69 and 70. 71 was a GovRec on uh, funding uh, improvements and uh, construction of way stations. MnDOT is responsible for, I believe, construction and maintenance and, and DPS under the State Patrol and C Commercial Vehicle Enforcement is responsible for enforcement. So this would be a piece for um, uh, infrastructure and maintenance, I believe. On line 71, the governor's rec was one million a year and the Senate has 500,000 a year from the general fund. Line 72 is a governor's rec for the funding of the rehabilitation of the Stone Arch Bridge. 
the governor had a five million one time, and the Senate has one point four two million for that item on, from the general fund. Um, the next line, I'm going to actually skip the next lines because that's a mistake in my spreadsheet. Um, so we're I, we're just going to ignore that for right now. <laughs> Those are statutory appropriations regarding rail grade safety, and that language is not currently in the draft. Um, so we'll skip down to state roads, um, change items starting on line 90, uh, again maintaining current service levels under operations and maintenance, and that's from the trunk highway, uh, multimodal transportation package IAJA match on line 91, that's another governor's rec as part of the federal match money, 22 million a year for, for that from trunk highway. Uh, line 92 was a bill we heard in committee for highways for habitat. Um, and uh, 92 is, uh, line 92 is a million dollars one time for general, from general fund for the Highways for Habitat program. And line 93 and 94 have to do with the Living Snow Fence program. Line 93 is one million one time for construction. 94 is maintenance of these along the highways, 165, 165,000 a year from the trunk highway. Line 95 has to do with... Um, I believe Senate File 2321 that has a number of traffic safety uh, provisions in there to do with speed mitigation and um, um, things of that nature. So this is one of those provisions. We'll see a couple of them. This is for public awareness campaigns around safe road zones. This is a $1 million appropriation from General Fund for that. And then there's a base increase. Um, the bill raises um, some new revenue we'll talk about later. And so there is some new trunk highway fund money to be appropriated. Um, and it's been appropriated proportionally in the state roads uh, areas. So this is a base increase here of 17 million in the first two years and then 11 million ongoing from Trunk Highway. <clears throat> Lines 105 and 106 are similar under planning and research under state road construction, uh, maintaining current service levels from the Trunk Highway and also a base increase from new revenue of 2 million a year in the first two years and 1 million ongoing. Program delivery change items start on line 114. Um, again, maintaining current service levels and IIJA match are the first two lines there, both ongoing from the Trunk Highway Fund. Um, then there's a one, line 116 was a governor's rec as well to maximize federal transportation climate funding, and that's been picked up at $2 million a year from the general fund. Line 117 um, was in the revised governor's recs on clean, uh, clean fuel, a working group on clean fuel standard economic impact. Um, and this was a 250,000 appropriation for the working group and a study from the general fund. And that GovRec has been picked up on the Senate side. Line 118 uh, was a bill uh, we heard in committee on land tra transfer and Upper Sioux Agency Park, I believe. Um, and this was the MnDOT piece. There was a, an old trunk highway that needed some appraisals and demolition work as part of that land transfer, and that is a 1.193 million appropriation from the general fund in the first year. Uh, lines 119 and 120 are part of that traffic safety um, uh, bill that we heard, speed mitigation on both rural high-risk highways and in work zones, and those are one-time appropriations totaling um, 20,300,000 on lines 119 and 120. And then again, another base increase from the new revenue raised in the bill for program delivery, 11 million uh, each year in the first two years, and then 7 million ongoing from Trunk Highway. State road construction starts on, uh, the change items are on line 130 and 131. I IJA match, um, uh, it's a pretty big match in the state road construction area, um, so to, uh, about 230 million in the first year and roughly 200 million in the second year and then a sm slightly smaller amount ongoing for that. And then line 131 is again base increase from the new revenue in this particular bill, 45 million a year in the first year, two years and then 29 million a year thereafter. Uh, line 41, 141 has debt service uh, for new bond authorizations. The governor I believe had 50 million um, of trunk highway bonding and his debt service is on, is on line 141 in that area. And uh, the Senate language has 450 million of trunk highway bonding. 300 million of that is for quarters of commerce and 150 for state road construction. And this would be the approximate debt service for that. <clears throat> on page four, Statewide radio communications, uh, the Senate picked up a governor's rec again about maintaining current service levels in that area from the Trunk Highway Fund. 
Then moving on to local roads, um, county state aid, municipal state aid, and some others. Uh, county state aid starts on 164. Um, there is a funding impact um, once you fund some things directly out of the highway user tax distribution fund, which is done in the D uh, Department of Public Safety sections, there's less money to be distributed to the state aid and trunk highway funds. So that's just showing that impact there of less, re uh, less appropriation. Uh, line 166, again, base increase from the new revenue that flows through the HUTDF to county state aid. That's on line 166. Um, similarly, under municipal state aid, there's the DPS funding impact, um, and it's a, a effect on the revenue and appropriations under the municipal state aid on line 175, and new revenue raised in the bill on line 177 for municipal state aid. Other local roads start on 184. There's a governor's rec to, uh, for the local transportation disaster support account. This is to help locals with matches for federal funds for disaster declarations. Um, and uh, there is a backlog of these costs right now, I believe, and that's about 3.3 million in the first year. And then the department desires to set up its own disaster support account to help with this ongoing need. So that's a million a year thereafter. Um, line 186 and 187 is one-time money for local roads and local bridges, 50 million for roads and 40 million for bridges. I believe that may have changed in the draft. There may be 45 million. It's, the total is 90 million. I believe it may be 45 million each in the draft. Um, and then there's some uh, statutory appropriations. Some revenue is raised later in the bill and deposited in small cities and larger cities assistance accounts. And that would be a statutory appropriation out of those accounts for the department to distribute. Moving down to agency management on page five, uh, maintaining current service levels. I won't go over again on lines 203 and 204. Um, then there's a more federal match on lines 205 through 207. These are for discretionary grants um, uh, in all modes uh, of, of transportation. 206 is some one-time money, 100 million from the general fund to assist local governments um, with uh, multimodal grants. Line 207 is a match for electric vehicle infrastructure money under the federal uh, act. Line 208 is some ongoing staffing needs. I believe it's 1.5 FTE uh, to uh, staff the new NEVI, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program that is set up in the bill. Uh, line 209 is 2 million one time to help uh, technical assistance grants for people applying, maybe local governments for applying for some of these federal discretionary grants. Uh, line 210 is another IAJ match piece ongoing, 5 million a year from Trunk Highway. Line 211 is a million dollars a year from General Fund for Tribal Affairs Training Programs. Uh, uh, 900,000 of this is for a construction training program, and 100,000 is for the department's ongoing Tribal Affairs uh, Relations Training. Line 212 um, is a partial governor's rec, uh, strategic technology system investments at the department, just some I IT investments. Um, I believe the Senate is carrying half of the governor's ask in the general fund. And then there's a line 213, is small community partnerships that the department um, uh, will carry out with the University of Minnesota, I believe. Um, and that's a million dollars a year in the first two years, one time. Uh, line 214 is uh, related to a transfer one time of general fund money into the new disadvantaged communities car sharing grant account. And that 500,000 statutory appropriation will, is showing up here and those grants will be made um, to car sharing um, uh, agencies, organizations in disadvantaged communities. Uh, line 223 under buildings is just another maintain current service levels amount from the trunk highway fund. And then we are done with, oh no, we're not. Line 224 um, picks up in the tails. That's why I didn't notice it. And this is eliminating an open appropriation that is meant to come online in fiscal year 2026. Um, currently the MnDOT central office building costs as are most of the operating costs covered through trunk highway fund appropriations. Um, and this in 2026 was going to shift it to as an open general fund appropriation and that is being repealed in the bill. So that shows some uh, less appropriation there for that. And we'll move on briefly to Metropolitan Council on page six. Uh, there's a 
uh, line 249 is a one-time $50 million appropriation from the general fund for the blue line extension, light rail transit, um, the Botno line. And then on line 250, there's a $1 million one-time appropriation for a land use study that is, um, that is uh, authorized in the bill <coughs> under Met Council. Uh, and then moving down to Department of Public Safety, um, I'll, I'm just going to breeze through the governor's recs on 265, maintaining current service levels. These are, are sprinkled throughout, and this is under admin and related services at DPS. So that would come from the general fund on line 265. Uh, the governor had a recommendation to increase FTEs at the department to uh, bolster their administrative services on line 266, and there's a partial uh, fulfillment of that GovRec uh, from the general fund on the Senate side. Public safety support. Uh, notable here is, let's see, uh, on line 276, that is a governor's rec to increase oversight staff, state rail safety, and that's a $20,000 a year general fund appropriation. Um, and I believe that is oversight of light rail safety on that line and not heavy rail. Uh, line 277 is a partial governor's rec on community engagement, again, increasing FTEs to do more community engagement with, from the department. And then another piece of the uh, DPS administration piece under public safety support, and that's a partial governor's rec as well. Moving down to page seven, uh, technology and support services under admin at DPS. Um, uh, again, picking up some general fund and trunk highway fund, governor's recs on maintaining current service levels at the department. Then we move to state patrol starting on line 312. Uh, there's a fiscal year 23 appropriation, one time of 6.7 from Trunk Highway for an operating deficiency under patrolling highways. Um, another maintain current service levels here, uh, for, again from the Trunk Highway because the state patrol is funded primarily through Trunk Highway. Uh, then there are, there's a governor's direct for a one-time uh, helicopter purchase, 14.5 uh, million one time from the general fund on line 314. And along with that on line 315 is money from the Trunk Highway Fund of 1.7 million a year for additional uh, pilots and other maintenance and upkeep on the helicopter. Lines 316 and 317 are similar. Uh, this is a uh, desire for the department to be accredited under, uh, I believe it's called the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies. And the governor's request was uh, about 611,000 in the first year, 350,000 in the second year from the general fund. Um, and the Senate did pick up that rec, but is funding it from the Trunk Highway Fund. And then on line 318, there's uh, another one from the governor's revised recommendations, um, a one-time general fund appropriation of 350,000 for a facility design for a new state patrol facility. And the Senate has picked up that recommendation on line 318. Uh, commercial vehicle enforcement, again, maintaining current service levels on line 328, again, from Trunk Highway as our almost all state patrol. And then on line 329, that's another governor's rec as a federal match under, uh, a, a state match for federal money under commercial vehicle enforcement, and that is to be able to um, hire more uh, officers under commercial, commercial vehicle enforcement. And that is, uh, the full governor's rec was picked up at about 5.2 million a year from Trunk Highway. Uh, capital security has uh, maintained current service levels on 336. These are from the general fund as that is the only part of state patrol funded through the general fund and their base. <clears throat> page eight, we, oh, page eight, uh, the top of page eight is the vehicle crimes unit under state patrol and they have a small operating deficiency on line 343 in fiscal year 23 and vehicle crimes unit is funded directly out of the highway user tax fund and that's why that money is coming out of there. Then we move on to driver and vehicle services, uh, uh, line 358, um, the department has begun using uh, an open appropriation that it already existed in law um, to fully fulfill its um, um, plate production um, uh, program. And because there was a money, an amount for that already in their direct base appropriation, this is reducing that and giving you know, money back to the account balance. Um, and let's see, line 359, uh, this is a governor's rec on, I believe, three or five new vehicle inspection sites. So 1.6 million in the first year and 1.3 million thereafter from the special revenue fund. And then um, there's some staffing increases related to some requirements under the independent expert review provisions, which we'll get to soon. 
Um, and then 362 was um, a statutory distribution. The 10 million a year in the first two years is, um, yeah, 10 million in the first two years is transfer from the general fund to a new full service provider account, full service providers being both driver's license agents and deputy registrars, and those distributions would come out of that in the statutory appropriation. The account will have some money thereafter, about 1.3 million from a surcharge that is collected to that account. Driver services, uh, the governor had a recommendation to pick up the cost for the driver's licenses for all bill. That law has been enacted and those appropriations were in that bill. It was not picked up on the Senate side. Um, that's another governor's rec to uh, uh, collect race and ethnicity info on driver's license credentials and that uh, recommendation was picked up there on line 373. Uh, and then on line 375, this is a provision as part of the uh, independent expert review provisions to provide equipment costs for those driver's license agents that wish to become full service providers. Moving down to traffic safety, there are a number here. Um, uh, there's the other piece on line 387 of the race and ethnicity info for credentials. Uh, there's some under traffic safety and some under driver services. So this is a small uh, 98,000 a year general fund appropriation for that. Line three, six, uh, 389 is a partial governor's rec for a new traffic safety data analytics center at the department. And um, I believe we're, the Senate has picked up half of the governor's request from the general fund for that. On page nine, uh, the governor had a recommendation for a new traffic safety advisory council. Um, uh, and the request was 2.5 million. The, the Senate is picking up uh, in this provision general fund appropriation of $2 million a year for the council. And then the rest on 391 through 398 are all Senate uh, initiatives. There's a school bus safety campaign that we heard in the committee. That's a 50,000 one-time appropriation. There's a move over law safety public awareness campaign of 100,000 uh, on line 392, one-time from general fund. Uh, line 393 is a, a one-time increase um, uh, the last budget bill contained approximately 15 million in grants for school bus stop arm camera grants. Okay, and uh, this is continuing at a, uh, two more million more for those grants. Uh, line 394 and 395, 396, 30, I believe the rest of these are related to the traffic safety. I believe it was Senate file 2321. There are a number of appropriations for different um, traffic safety enforcement measures, and these were all picked up. Some of these were in the bill as ongoing um, and to fit in the target, they have been made one time in the first year. Um, and then moving down, there are two pieces under Department of Revenue uh, that are statutory, 422 and 423. One of them is a, a collection, um, a, appropriation to the Department of Revenue for collections of the new Metro sales and use tax. And then a, a, also a collection uh, appropriation for collection of the retail delivery fee that's also in the bill. And then on line 429, we don't often see human services in our, uh, in our budget bill, but this is uh, statutory grants to, non to the Department of Human Services for them to make grants to nonprofits for food delivery services. And this money comes out of the new retail delivery fee that is collected later in the bill. <clears throat> on page 10, there are a few transfers, uh, lines 447 through 449 are under MnDOT. Um, there's uh, one-time appropriation. This is related to the IIJA federal funds match. Uh, the governor's rec had it $423 million uh, from the general fund directly to the trunk highway fund to pay for federal funds match of trunk highway projects. Um, the Senate has it at $323 million. Um, I should note that the governor's request for appropriations of trunk highway amounts related to the IIJA uh, matching provisions are picked up in the bill. It's just that the Senate bill raises more revenue for trunk highway, so that was paid more out of trunk highway rather than a general fund transfer. Line 448 is a one-time uh, transfer from general fund to the disadvantaged communities car sharing grant account. I mentioned that earlier of 500,000 one time. Four, line 449 is uh, transfers from the general fund to the active transportation account, uh, which will make grants uh, under the Greater Minnesota Transit Division, and that's 25 million each in the first two years, and then 3.6 million thereafter. And then one transfer under Department of Public Safety is uh, one-time amounts from the general fund to the new full service provider account. 
um, and that is on line 452 of 10 million each in the first two years. I'm not going to go through every line of the revenues. I'll group them together. Uh, line 459, this is the revenue being booked from the tax changes on vehicle registration tax in the bill. Uh, and you'll see that's uh, directly to Highway User Tax Distribution Fund. Uh, lines 460 through 465 are um, the amounts picked up in the changes to the auto part sales tax dedication. Currently in current law, auto part sales tax, a flat amount of about $145 million goes to the Highway User Tax and the rest remains in the general fund. So this is a very slow phase in of the remaining general fund piece to other transportation um, areas. Uh, and you'll see there's bits for uh, the CASA, the M MSA account, uh, the MSA fund, um, small cities and larger cities accounts under special revenue fund. And then lines 466 through 469 is revenue related to the retail delivery fee that is set at 75 cents in the bill, and that revenue is distributed um, between the highway user tax distribution fund, county state aid highway fund, municipal state aid street fund, and again, that 1% going to the food service, I believe it's called the food service delivery account that's created in the bill. Lines 470 and 471 have to do with the MVEST increase um, that's in the bill. Currently MVEST, the motor vehicle sales tax, tax rate is 6.5%. The bill raises it to 6.87% and also uh, makes a change to the split uh, between Metro Transit and Greater Minnesota Transit. Um, these amounts are to some degree constitutionally dedicated, um, so there is some... Uh, there is some play between the transit split. Currently in law is 36% to Metro Transit and 4% to Greater Minnesota, and this will change it to 34.5 Metro, 5.5 Greater Minnesota, and you'll see the, the changes there on lines 470 and 471. Lines 472 through 474 is a new surcharge, $7.50 surcharge on tab fee renewals, and that money is split evenly between town roads, small cities, and larger cities accounts. Uh, 475, 476, those were taken off. Um, uh, let's see. Sorry. 478 is just the um, acknowledgement of the revenue, the transfer from general fund to trunk highway fund for the federal funds match that was a partial governor's rec. Uh, and line, similarly, 479 and 480 is showing the revenue from the earlier transfers I mentioned from general fund to these other accounts. Under Metropolitan Council, there you see revenue on lines 484 and 485 from uh, the new 0.75% uh, uh, metro sales and use tax in the Metropolitan Transit area. 0.625% uh, of that would uh, go to transit, and 0.125% of the 0.75 would go to local county roads. And then uh, line 486 is just the metro transit piece of the MVEST increase to 6.875 and the transit split shift. The line above on 471 was for the greater Minnesota transit piece. And then under Department of Public Safety, there were a few gov governor's recs that were picked up and some others, let's see, on line um, 490, this is a governor's rec for the use of social security numbers um, that the, the commissioner can provide to the Department of Revenue for revenue recapture and debt collection and that um, uh, recommendation was picked up, and that's a 1.6 million revenue gained to special revenue in the first year and 36,000 thereafter. Um, also on line 491, this is eliminating the out-of-state knowledge test for driver's licenses for people that already have a license, and that would be a slight loss of revenue. Um, the, the Senate is booking slightly more lost revenue because the Senate's language also has the motorcycle endorsement piece. Uh, on line 492, this is a DVS filing fee increase. The governor and the Senate have it modeled slightly differently, um, but uh, it, it shows a, a slight increase in revenue in 492 of 623,000 in the first year, 831,000 thereafter, and that is to um, the driver services fee, uh, operating account. Um, and line, uh, let's skip down. 494 is reinstating a fee that sunsetted, I believe, at the end of fiscal year 22 of 75 cents for Real ID, um, trying to um, acknowledge that maybe re applying for Real IDs take a little more counter time, a little more uh, staff work, and that fee had blinked off and that will be reinstated under this provision at uh, 9 958,000 in revenue to special revenue fund a year. 
Uh, 495 is an increase in the fee for driver's licenses and identification cards, and uh, that is the governor's rec, and that is book to bring in 8.9 million a year to special revenue. Line 497 is a provision we'll hear about later that uh, allows full service providers to issue certain credentials, certain records that now only DVS can provide. So those um, fees would now go to full service providers and this would be a loss of revenue, 130,000 a year for DVS. And then 499, uh, line 499 just those shows that uh, transfer again from general fund to the full service provider account one time. Uh, line 503 shows some income tax tax interaction with increasing the vehicle registration tax um, since income taxes um, uh, that can be claimed as a deduction and income taxes may uh, have a slight revenue decrease uh, from the general fund and then on line 504 the metro sales and use tax that is uh, uh, revenue to the Department of Revenue for collecting uh, from the proceeds for collecting the tax Lines 507 through 5010 is just a summary line we do when we raise revenue for highway user tax showing how it flows into the Trunk Highway CASA and MSA uh, account, uh, funds. And then just briefly on the back page, this is a summary of the general fund spending and revenues netted out in the bill. What I'll point out is uh, there's not a line number, but under the uh, spread under the box, there's a general fund target of 1.07. 1 I can't say that. One billion seventy-five million um, in 2425, and 130 million in the tails in 2627, and then a comparison box showing the current net impact in the bill compared to the target. There's five million dollars currently on the bottom line in the current, uh, the next biennium, and zero in the next biennium. That's a little rounding error there, and that is the spreadsheet. Um, I'm going to move on, Madam Chair. Very briefly, <laughs> the bonding article is Article 2, and I think I already mentioned that, so just very briefly, um, if you're looking in your A1, it starts on page 29, I think, 29. And um, as I, I said on page 30, you can see there's $300 million uh, in trunk highway bonding for quarters of commerce. Um, and 150 million for state road construction. Both of these provisions state that the commissioner may use up to 17% of the amount for program delivery. This is pretty standard in these um, sorts of appropriations. Bond sale expenses in section three, um, uh, the usual amount of 400, comparatively 450,000 to the commissioner of MMB for selling the bonds. And then the bond sale authorization of these amounts on page uh, 31. And then Article 3, I'm going to go through quickly and then hand it over to Mr. Greenfield. These are um, some of the transportation finance pieces that I've mentioned briefly uh, that starts on line, page 31. Uh, section 1 is establishing uh, a statutory appropriation from the Small Cities Assistance Account that already exists in law. Since now the bill is uh, dedicating some revenue ongoing to the Small Cities Assistance Account, it makes sense to uh, make a statutory appropriation to the commissioner to distribute those on an ongoing basis. Um, and line, uh, Section 2 and Section 3 are just conforming changes to that, uh, to that section of statute and making it a statutory appropriation. Uh, section 4 on page 32 is the creation of an analogous larger cities assistance account. Um, the differentiation, of course, is small cities are those cities that are not eligible for municipal state aid funding because their population is less than 5,000. Larger cities is for those cities that are eligible, but uh, MSA funding only goes towards state aid routes and there is no dedicated funding for the, um, the local roads in those cities. And this, this assistance account will collect revenues raised in this bill and then distribute them. You'll see that on uh, subdivision two there at the bottom of 32. Uh, section five uh, is the changes to the vehicle registration tax um, on line 33.9. You'll see the tax rate change, 1.285% to 1.575%. Um, you may notice a blank, I just wanna point out on line 33.5, that's a technical change that um, is still being worked out, but it's the same uh, same effect of the revenue. Um, let's see, and then on page 34, 
Another change to the vehicle registration tax is a change to the depreciation schedule upon which the tax is calculated. It's a slight slowing down of the depreciation schedule. Um, um, and then, but by the 10th year, it still winds up at 10% of the price. And then the minimum tax is changed on line 34.16 so that the minimum tax you would pay on an older vehicle would be $30 and not 35 as under current law. Uh, section 6 through 10 all have to do with uh, establishing the new retail de delivery fee. So I'll just go through those really briefly. Um, section 6 is definitions related to it. Um, section 7 is actually imposing the fee. It's a 75 cents per delivery. And um, yeah, that just imposes the tax. Uh, section 8 on page 36 uh, states certain exemptions from the retail delivery, uh, not a tax, a fee, retail delivery fee. Um, and uh, specifically on lines 36.8, 36.9, um, exempts clothing from the exemption. So the retail delivery fee would, would apply to delivery of clothing as well. Even if that's correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, section 9 has to do with just collection administration of the fee, um, how that is handled and who administers it. Section 10 is a deposit of the proceeds. Um, uh, here's a little... When we um, were very busy drafting, we missed something. So this is something that will be picked up when we do amendments on Monday. But if you refer to uh, the spreadsheet, um, I can point out to you that the intention here and the booking of the revenues, there's a blank on 37.4 um, showing where the deposit of the balance of proceeds from the fee will go. And um, the intention is 70% to the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund, 20% to County State Aid Highway Fund, 9% to Municipal State Aid Street Fund, and again, 1% to this new food delivery support account created in the next section. Uh, so 1% would go into this account in Section 12. That money is appropriated to the Commissioner of Human Services for grants to nonprofit organizations to provide transportation of home-delivered meals, groceries, etc. Section 13 is, um, this is allowing the Department of Revenue to recover costs that they incur when collecting the retail delivery fee, as they do with other recovering costs related to other fees or taxes. Uh, section 14, um, it lists, uh, section 14 lists the delivery fee as one of the delivery charges that is not included in the sales price when calculating sales tax. Uh, section 15 um, has to do with auto part sales tax. So the the change you'll see mostly at the bottom of page 40 and, and on page 41 um, that the existing, as I've said, the auto part sales tax right now, a flat amount per year, 145.6 million uh, calculated monthly is deposited in the highway user tax fund. This would change that allocation um, on 41.9, 47.5% in each year would go to the highway user tax, so a percent rather than a flat amount. Uh, and then the general fund will get a certain percent each year and, and phase down over, I believe, about 10 years. So that in fiscal year 2033, the 0% would be going to the general fund. And in every year after the highway user tax and general fund percents um, are, are, are deposited, the remainder is allocated as follows under 41.22 to 41.25. 60% to County State Aid Highway, 22% to Municipal State Aid Street Fund, and 9% each to small and larger cities' accounts. <clears throat> uh, section 16 starts on page 43. Um, this, uh, this starts a number of sections dealing with the, met the new Metro Transit sales tax. Uh, section 16 just allows the imposition of the tax by local government. Uh, section 17... Uh, imposes a tax and sets de some definitions. Uh, the Metropolitan Council would oppose the tax at a rate of three quarters of 1% on retail sales and uses in the metropolitan area. Um, and there's some language about um, administration. Uh, lines 44.19 and 44.20 have to do with the deposit. All the proceeds are deposited in the existing Metropolitan Area Transit account. Um, uh, sec subdivision 5 allows the Met Council to issue revenue bonds secured by the proceeds of the tax. Moving on to section 18 on page 45, this has to do with motor vehicle sales tax. Uh, currently, motor vehicle sales tax is collected at a rate of 6.5. This increases it to 6.875. And then on uh, section 19, this is a change to the revenue allocation under MVES that I touched on earlier. The change you'll see is at the top of 
page 46, um, changing the percentages to the Metropolitan Area Transit Account and the Greater Minnesota Transit Account. Section 20 allocates the proceeds of the Metro uh, Sales and Use Tax. Uh, on, line, on Subdivision 2, you'll see 5 6 of it goes to the Metropolitan Council, 1 6 goes to the Transportation Advisory Board, and then Subdivision 3 use, uh, lists some uses uh, of the funds that Metropolitan Council uh, can use it for. Uh, specifically on 46.20, it starts that the Council must annually expend a portion of sales tax revenues in each of the following categories, so there is some prescriptive language there. Um, and then on subdivision four, there's use of funds by the Transportation Advisory Board of that one-sixth of the tax. These are for grants to highway projects in the metro area. I want to point out there's another drafting mistake, and I'm, I apologize for this. Subdivision five is, is not intended to be in this language. Um, that starts on 4724, so that will be struck in the next technical amendment, I believe. Um, and then there's some uh, just administrative pieces about the metro sales tax. And then that we get to Article 4, and I can turn it over to Mr. Greenfield to move on. Thank you, Ms. Boyd. Mr. Greenfield. Thank you, Madam Chair and Chair Dibble. Uh, and Article 4 is Senate File 2099. This is the bill that was heard by the Transportation Committee on March 10th uh, and implements many of the recommendations from the uh, independent expert report um, submitted to the legislature uh, in January of 2022. Um, and I'll go through some of those provisions, but I won't go into as much granular detail, given that this committee has heard this, um, most of this language before. Section 1 provides the definition of a full service provider in the vehicle registration statute. Um, a full service provider is a person who performs the functions of both a deputy registrar and a full service driver's license agent. Um, this, uh, allow, this emphasis on a full service provider uh, is kind of throughout uh, the beginning sections of Article 4. In Section 2, um, full service providers are authorized to issue driver and vehicle records and collect a fee. And uh, Section 3 requires a full service provider to impose a surcharge on certain requests. Section 4 and 5 also um, deal with a full serv service provider's uh, surcharge ability. And Section 5 monitors and audits um, the full service providers providing documents uh, under Section 3. Section 6 is a surcharge, and there are some slight changes from the uh, 2099 draft, uh, or 2099 language that we heard uh, in the Transportation Committee a couple of weeks ago. Um, the mechanics of this section I'll have Ms. Boyd um, briefly describe. Ms. Boyd. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this section actually... Uh, combines two different provisions in the bill. Um, I spoke earlier about a $7.50 surcharge on um, uh, the every filing fee for vehicle registration renewal, and that's in this section of statute two, which is why it ended up in this chapter. So that's on line 51.13 and 51.14. And then on the next page, starting on pay, line 52.12, it shows the disposition of the revenue related to that surcharge. So those aren't, that isn't really an IER proposal. The IER picks back up on 52.19 in this uh, section, and that is the online surcharge of $1, uh, which will be deposited, uh, online surcharge, uh, every online transaction charges a dollar surcharge. And the proceeds from that will be deposited in the full service provider account and distributed to full service providers. And then paragraph H, um, the deputy registrar uh, surcharge on uh, in-person transactions of 50 cents, those are retained by the deputy registrar. Mr. Greenfield. Thank you, Madam Chair and Chair Dibble. Uh, section 7 and, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, Section 8 is a uh, provision that kind of ties back into the authorities that are granted to full service providers. Uh, so full service providers under Section 8 are allowed to provide copies of accident reports and collect a fee for that service. Um, the other portion of the IER uh, policies um, relevant to this committee uh, involve more customer service oriented changes. So Section 7 um, and Section 11 and Section 13 are examples of that. Those have to deal with recommendations made by the independent expert um, that are about forward-facing aspects uh, of where DVS can improve the customer service experience. So I won't go into too much detail about those. Um, section 9 and Section 10 um, 
again, deal with the monitoring and auditing provisions and uh, cross-references the definition of full service providers. Uh, I want to turn now to section 12, which can be found on page, uh, sorry, 30, uh, 56, starting on line 14. This increases the filing fee for driver's license transactions, fees for, new, uh, for a new application for a real ID compliant um, or enhanced driver's license is $16, while fees for a renewal application are $11. So this is um, talking about uh, the, the filing fee that goes into either a new or a renewal for a driver's license application. Uh, section 14 on page uh, 57 addresses the uh, system access security and auditing requirements. Uh, so it prohibits the commissioner from suspending or revoking access to MinDrive when a person properly accessed the data, regardless of whether a transaction was complete. This was uh, a recommendation contained in the IER report um, that essentially tries to readjust the appeals process and creates an appeals process uh, for people who have been shut out of the accessing MinDrive um, and I think that further detail was covered in, on this proposal a couple of weeks ago. Section 15 on page 58, line 31, uh, has a small change from the language uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, the, the language from the first engrossment says that the commissioner must ensure that the, there is a following number of locations, uh, exam station locations. The language has been changed to say that the commissioner must ensure that no fewer than the following number of exam station locations and then prescribes the same schedule that was picked up in the first engrossment. So the essential effect of this is uh, the, the DVS could operate more exam stations than the permitted amount in the year, fiscal years 25 through 27, but they have to maintain still the number of 93 uh, for fiscal year 24. Section 16 is the uh, waiving written examination requirements if a license was issued from another jurisdiction. I'll note there's a small technical change to add United States territories to the eligible jurisdictions for waiving written examination requirements. Um, the previous language in the first engrossment of Senate File 2099 just referred to United, uh, any state or jurisdiction with jurisdiction applying to um, licenses issued by the armed forces. Um, Section 17 is another one of those customer service um, forward-facing recommendations which requires DPS to publicly post student pass rates for each driver training school. And then section 18 through 22 or 21 um, are a fund creation that I'll have Ms. Boyd uh, address in detail. I, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I promise I won't give too much detail. Uh, section 18 creates a new driver and vehicle services fund and moves the operating accounts of driver and vehicle services and their technology account into this fund and out of the special revenue fund. Um, that's done also in sections 19 and 20, just specifying the new fund. Um, what section 19 also does is combines the existing driver services operating account and vehicle services operating account into one account, the driver and vehicle services operating account, and makes changes related to that. Uh, section 21 creates the new full service provider account and also locates it in the new driver and vehicle services fund. And that's what that does. I'll pass it back. Mr. Greenfield. Thank you, Madam Chair and Chair Dibble and Ms. Boyd. Uh, Section 22 is a reporting requirement. This is unchanged. Uh, this has to do with the overall structure of debit registrar and driver's license agent financial sustainability. It uh, requires DPS to report on evalu evaluating the role that red DRs and DLAs play within DVS operations and is due on July 1st, 2024. The second report uh, requires DPS to uh, report to the legislature on the implementation of provisions in this bill and other recommendations that were not picked up contained in the IER report. Uh, IER, that is redundant to say IER report. Uh, Article 5 is a whole raft of conforming changes created by uh, what Ms. Boy just referenced, where the combination of the driver services operating account and the vehicle services operating account are now combined into a single account, uh, the driver vehicle services operating account. So sections 1 to 20 are those conforming changes. Section 21 is a reviser instruction to complete the process of con making conforming changes. And Section 22 repeals certain statutes to comply with the creation of the driver and vehicle services operating account. 
Article 6 is an article containing uh, a wide variety of provisions pertaining to the Metropolitan Council, uh, both in terms of its governance and operations. Uh, article 6 incorporates a variety of bills heard by the Senate Transportation Committee. Uh, there's been a published, uh, what I call a change summary that details the bills that were brought in uh, as well as new initiatives. Um, so I'm going to be kind of looking at that while going through section by section. So if you're following along, that might be helpful to look at. Um, among the bills that were heard by the Senate Transportation Committee that are picked up in Article 6 are Senate File 1049, which is the transit safety bill heard a few weeks ago by the Senate Transportation Committee. The first engrossment has been incorporated into this article. Senate File 1625, uh, as amended by the A3 amendments, that is the designation of a responsible authority for non -arter or for arterial bus rapid projects exceeding a cost of $100 million, shifting that from the Metropolitan Council to the Department of Transportation. Senate File 2790, which was a uh, Senator Morrison bill heard uh, just last week regarding climate action plans, greenhouse gas benchmarks, and the incorporation of the climate action plan into Metropolitan Council's comprehensive plan, uh, as well as a land use study. Um, that bill was not formally adopted or referred out of the committee, so the language from the A1 Delete Everything Amendment as amended by the A2 has been incorporated into Article 6. And finally, uh, Senator Marty's Metro Mobility Bill, Senate File 1933, uh, was also not adopted by or passed out by the Senate Transportation Committee and was laid over. So the Delete Everything language, SES 1933 A1, uh, as amended by the A2, has been incorporated into Article 6. New provisions in Article 6 include uh, a Metropolitan Council Governance Charter Commission, amended language from the House Companion to the Election of Metropolitan Council Members, um, House File 2090, um, with some slight changes. Additional reporting ex on expenditures and cost estimates for the Southwest Light Rail Transit Project, uh, which is an amendment of session law. And Senator Dibble's uh, 2021 language um, establishing a metro area active transportation program with the, within the Metropolitan Council. So now I'm going to go section by section, um, and I won't provide a whole host of detail, but I'll identify as I go through Article 6 um, whether a uh, piece has been brought in before or whether it's a new provision. Uh, so starting on Section 1 of Article 6, I'm just going to scroll to my page here. Do you know what page it is? Sorry. Just one second. I'm sorry. Section 6 starts on page 77 on line 27. Section 1 is a Senate File 1049 proposal that authorizes transit rider investment program personnel to administer Narcan. Section 2 is on page 78. This is Senate File 1625 that I just mentioned about the designation of a responsible authority for non-arterial bus rapid transit facilities. Page 79 is section three. This uh, section three and four on page 79 and 80 are surcharges that stem from the transit rider um, for various rider conduct violations and how those surcharges are distributed. Section five begins the proposed Metropolitan Council Charter Commission. Uh, section five um, designates a legislative uh, delegation of all elected members of the House and Senate whose legislative district includes a portion of the seven county metropolitan area, Carver, Hennepin, Scott, Anoka, Ramsey, Dakota, or Washington. Um, it requires that the delegation, legislative delegation has a chair from both the Senate and a chair from the House. Um, and they function as co-chairs of the Metropolitan Council legislative delegation. Uh, section, these Metropolitan Governance Council provisions are effective August 1, 2023. Section 6 uh, establishes the nominations and appointments provisions for the Charter Commission. Um, within 30 days of August 1, the Metropolitan Council Legislative Declaration, Delegation has to nominate 38 persons as candidates for the appointment of a Charter Commission to frame a Metropolitan Council Governance Charter. Two persons from each of the 16 Metropolitan Council districts are, and six at-large candidates also shall be nominated. Uh, nominated persons cannot be an employee of a city or county, an elected official, or a registered lobbyist. Uh, so the, um, after the nomination process occurs within 30 days of that selection, the judges of Ramsey County, the 2nd Judicial District, shall appoint the Charter Commission of 17 members 
consisting of one appointee from each metropolitan district and one appointee to serve as large. Uh, the reason is located in Ramsey County is because that is where the Metropolitan Council is located. Uh, the terms of the Charter Commission, uh, the members hold their term until December 31, 31 2024. Uh, and there is a, a provision that if the charter is adopted at the November 2024 election, the members shall continue to serve until a new commission is appointed or until the effective date of the charter that's been ratified by the voters, whichever occurs first. Within 30 days after the appointment, the charter commission has to meet, elect a chair, and establish rules, operations, and quorum procedures. Subdivision four on page 81 provides for the expenses and administrations of the charter commission. Page 82, section seven of article six sets forth the powers and the duties of the charter commission. And before December 30, uh, 31st, 2024, the Charter Commission shall deliver to the Metropolitan Council a draft of a proposed charter. Uh, the charter must be signed, or the report must be signed by a majority of the members of the Charter Commission and may provide for any form of government consistent with the Minnesota Constitution and may provide for the election of Metropolitan Council members. Upon delivery um, of that charter, section eight governs the election requirements. Uh, after the delivery of the proposed charter to the Metropolitan Council, the chair must present the charter to the Secretary of the State, who then works with the county auditor of each of the seven counties of the metropolitan area to administer an identical question to the voters in the 2024 general election. Uh, and that ballot form is placed there on page 82, lines 20 to 24. Section 9 article of Article 6 is the effective date. Uh, if a majority of all voters voting in the election vote in favor of the proposed charter, it shall be adopted and shall take effect two years after the election. Um, in the meantime, the courts are unable to take judicial notice of the charter. And section 10 is the final piece of the Charter Commission proposal. Uh, that provides that if the charter includes a provision requiring metropolitan councils to be elected, the legislature shall amend chapter 473 and other related statutes to effectuate that new charter provision. Um, so that would incorporate changes to state statute before the charter um, may uh, be adopted by the voter, uh, may be enacted in 2026 after that two-year period from when the voters ratify it. Section 11 is from Senate file 2790. That is not needing further detail. Skipping ahead to page 84, um, this is, uh, section 12 is also another section from Senate file 2790. Section 13 is the um, proposal from 2021 brought in by Senator Dibble. This was not heard by the Senate Transportation Committee thus far this year, but it is a 2021 bill that authorizes the Metropolitan Council to create an active transportation program um, and essentially make uh, award grants to political subdivisions and local nonprofits and have a, a, has a variety of project selection criteria for active transportation projects. This um, project continues on page 85 through page 86. Sections 14 through 21 beginning on page 86 and wrapping all the way until page nine, uh, the, beginning, the end of page 89 are conforming changes as a result of the designation of a responsible authority for arterial bus rapid projects brought in by Senate file 1625. Section 22 is a transit rider activity code of conduct. This was brought in in Senate file 1049, the first engrossment. Um, again, the code of conduct um, must be adopted by the Metropolitan Council and then subdivisions three and four address both paid fare zones and light rail transit fa facility monitoring, including the placement of cameras, a public address system, and sufficient associated lighting on light rail transit stations. Section 23 on page 91 is the Transit Rider Investment Program, or TRIP. Uh, this is the, uh, the TRIP personnel program is the, uh, are authorized to issue administrative citations for certain code of conduct violations. Um, this has been extensively discussed when Senate file 1049 was heard before the Transportation Committee. Um, I'll note on page 91, that trip personnel are specifically authorized by the Metropolitan Council uh, to perform fare inspection and enforcement, and they are not peace officers or community service officers. So they function as, some, as a separate uh, class of individuals on transit vehicles and stations. Page 92 continues the uh, prescription of the trip program, including the creation of a trip manager, uh, essentially the managerial, the person in charge of the trip program. 
Uh, subdivision four sets forth the requirements for those duties uh, for the personnel. Subdivision five prefer, provides for the training requirements for trip personnel. Uh, page 93, subdivision six is the um, subdivision governing administrative citations um, where the transit official or the, the trip personnel has the exclusive authority to issue an administrative citation to a person who commits a violation uh, in terms of fare evasion. Uh, an administrative citation is uh, the requirements are governed um, on both subdivision six and subdivision seven, uh, as well as the disposition requirements. And again, this was covered when Senate file 1049 was before the transportation committee. Moving ahead to section uh, 24 on page 94. This is a report to the legislature on transit safety and rider experience. Um, this requires the Metropolitan Council to submit an annual report by February 15th to the transportation committees of both the House and Senate um, about the trip personnel and provide an overview on transit safety issues and actions taken by the council to improve safety, including improvements made to equipment and infrastructure. Um, I'll note that uh, there are extensive requirements for analyzing the trip program on page 90, uh, 95. Moving ahead to page 96 of Article 6, Section 25 is a section from 2790. Section 26 is the uh, changes to the criminal statutes um, regarding the tr uh, Senate File 1049 uh, and in terms of fare evasion. So this uh, provides for certain forms of trying to evade paying a fare for, uh, on a light rail vehicle or on a light rail facility that's classified as a petty misdemeanor. Um, on page 97, on uh, section 27, this is an additional petty misdemeanor section, uh, and this provides that littering on a uh, vehicle providing public transit service is a petty misdemeanor. Section 28 on page 97 is the misdemeanor crimes uh, that are uh, performed while on a transit vehicle or at a transit facility. They include smoking, urinating or defecating, consuming an alcoholic beverage, uh, damaging a transit vehicle or facility to the extent uh, or equivalent of criminal damage to property to the fourth degree, uh, disorderly conduct, and a peace officer is authorized to order a person to depart a transit vehicle or facility for a violation. This removes the requirement under current law that uh, requires a warning and a continuation of current conduct. Uh, I'll note that those uh, prohibited activities are newly prohibited activities spelled out in statute. Section 29 is, uh, again, a 1049 provision that just essentially adds trip personnel to authorized transit representatives to issue the administrative citations. Um, so there are um, other people who have that authority as well. But I will note that the administrative citation piece for fare inspection and enforcement is specifically reserved with trip personnel. So there's a bit of a separation there, but under 609, that is referring to criminal based issues, so it has nothing to do with the administrative citation pieces that are uh, a part of that. So there's a little bit of a split there. Uh, on page 99, section 30, this is the study on post-COVID, uh, uh, the, the post-pandemic public transportation um, language. This was a Senator Jasinski bill heard by, um, heard by the Senate Transportation Committee. I believe that is Senate File 622, the first engrossment. Um, section 31 on page 100 is amending 2022 session law. Uh, this to include um, some requirements, uh, some, some reporting requirements that were captured in the Office of the Legislative Auditor's report that was released a few weeks ago. So the Metropolitan Council is required to report to the legislature on the total expenditure pro on the expenditures on the Southwest project to date and the total project cost estimate. Of note in paragraph C, um, there are extensive requirements for the Metropolitan Council to su submit an expenditure notification for review and comment to the legislature uh, and, for the, um, and to the members of the Legislative Commission on Metropolitan Government. The notification must include the following for each expenditure, um, including an, an expenditure subtotal amount, the specific cost category, and an identification of the nature of the expenditure. Um, and there is an intent of the legislature paragraph on page 101 beginning on line 6 that if there are substantial changes to the governance structure of Metropolitan Council, then those reporting requirements would be repealed. 
Page 101, Section 32 creates a Commission on Metropolitan Governance. This was the Delete Everything to House File 2092. Uh, that is the companion to Senator Dibble's election of Metropolitan Council members. This um, is most of the language from Section 32. However, um, in both Subdivision 1 and in Subdivision uh, 4, there is a reference to the possibility of this uh, commission drafting a Home Rule Charter that would provide for the election of Metropolitan Council members, uh, if that is the direction that the commission decides to proceed. Um, so that uh, governance uh, structure that is being explored by the Metropolitan uh, Governance Commission is provided for in Subdivision 4, which is on page 102. Um, so it must include in a cost-benefit analysis of direct election of members to the Metropolitan Council, a combination of direct election and appointed members, a council of governments which would replace the Metropolitan Council, reapportioning responsibilities, and any other regional governance approaches that are viable alternatives to the current structure of the Metropolitan Council. And then the final clause of that duty applies to, after reviewing the evidence for that cost-benefit analysis on the governance structure, the study commission has the authority to prepare a home rule charter for the Metropolitan Council that will be referred to the voters, or submitted to the voters during the 2024 election. Um, Subdivision fives and six provide for further um, requirements for the commission, requiring the Metropolitan Council to cooperate, as well as state and metropolitan agencies. Subdivision six provides that uh, members of the commission may not receive compensation or per diem. Subdivision seven requires the LCC to provide administrative support. Subdivision eight requires the Metropolitan Commission to be subject to the open meeting law. And subdivision nine requires the commission to report its findings to the legislature by February 1st, 2024. Section 33 on page 103 of Article 6, that is the uh, ridership reports on uh, crime statistics and ridership statistics that was brought into Senate File 1049, but it was a standalone provision that was adopted as an amendment to 1049, so it's in the first engrossment. Page 103, Section 34 is the Metro Mobility Enhancement Pilot Program, that's Senate File 1933. Um, again, we didn't pass that bill out of the committee, but uh, the A1 amendment language is in, uh, is in the omnibus here. Uh, on page 105, section 35 is the land use study for the Metropolitan Council. This is Article 2 to Section 1 of Senate File 2790. And finally, uh, there are uh, the, the last section of Article 6 is the Transit Service Intervention Project. That is a Senate File 1049 provision, um, as well as a provision that was carried in Senate File 2560, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and that provides for high visibility intervention with social services personnel um, beginning um, this summer uh, after a period of three weeks, um, Metropolitan Council is required to deploy the social services intervention teams on a mobile basis on light rail transit lines and facilities and uh, they are supposed to perform face-to-face on-site interactions with transit riders experiencing homelessness, uh, transit riders with substance use disorders, and establish coordinated intervention that consists of um, intervention with personnel from social services, community service officers, and, and peace officers. Then there's a second phase of that outreach that begins after the conclusion of the first period where uh, there's both social services and law enforcement partners involved. Um, and the remaining provisions of the Transit Service Intervention Program, or TSIP, is set forth on page 107 and 108. Uh, of note that there is a reporting requirement um, provided uh, that requires the trip manager who is administering the Transit Service Intervention Project to submit a status report to the chairs and ranking minority members of the transportation committees. So there will be a monthly report from the trip manager to the Senate Transportation Committees on the progress and the summary of activities for the Transit Service Intervention Project. And that concludes Article 6, the Metropolitan Council Governance and Organization Article. Article 7 is not changed, so I don't need to highlight too much about it. However, it is the um, entirety of Senate File 912, which is the Bill, Bill Dooley Bicycle Safety Act. Um, unfortunately, the title of the Bill Dooley Safety Act is the only section not included under this article. Um, it provides for not active transportation and uh, other uh, forms of uh, services for, for uh, training for, for school children. 
Um, this is a first engrossment and it's made it stop both in the transportation committee and in education. Um, and I'm gonna move on to article eight in the instance of brevity. Um, so we're gonna pick back up on page 117 with the miscellaneous article. So Article 8 incorporates a variety of bills that were heard by the Senate Transportation Committee uh, during the 2023 session, as well as a small number of chair initiatives and governor's recommendations. Section 1 is Senate File 723. This is uh, a small change to the data security account for the legislative auditor. Section 2 is Section 1 from 2321. That is Senator Carlson's Traffic Safety Advisory Council. Um, this language is from the first engrossment. Uh, of notes, there were changes made in committee that added additional members from the Driver and Traffic Safety Education Association, the Association for Pupil Transit, uh, Transportation, and the State Trauma Advisory Council. And these changes can be seen on page 119, lines four to seven. Section three is a governor's recommendation uh, and, a chair, uh, and a chair initiative. This provides for the classification of the race and ethnicity data as part of a driver's license application. This classifies it as private data. Um, this language was pulled from Senate File 1946, which is the governor's uh, policy, or governor's budget bill. And um, of note, the change, uh, the classification is on page 121, lines four to seven. It also uh, specifically requires um, the Office of Traffic Safety within DPS to receive the data from DVS for the only for the purpose of research, evaluation, and public reports. And this uh, section um, providing for private data is effective for applications received on or after July, January 1, 2024. Section four is Highways for Habitat. That's Senate File 718 that was heard by the Senate Transportation Committee. Um, again, this bill was not um, formally passed out by the Senate Transportation Committee. Um, so there were some small changes um, in subdivision three on page 122, um, the as introduced version of seven and 18 required training for department personnel. There was an amendment in committee that just said that MnDOT has to develop the training, not require it. In subdivision four on page 122, um, those standards, managements, and best practices uh, have a feasibility requirement to the beginning of paragraph B. That is the second amendment that was adopted to 718 in committee uh, weeks ago. Section five is Senate file 2767. That was a Senator Jasinski bill that codified the highway purpose, non-highway purpose report from the Attorney General. Um, of note, the language that was adopted was a delete everything, Senate file, the A1, um, but chair's initiative removed paragraph B. Um, section six is a uh, transportation greenhouse gas emission impact assessment. That is article three, section one from Senate file 2790. Um, Senator Morrison's bill. Um, this is in, not in the Metropolitan Council article because it has to deal with the Department of Transportation establishing greenhouse gas benchmark, greenhouse gas emission benchmarks. Slow down on that one. Section seven is a chair initiative that begins on page 126. Uh, under current law, the amount that is appropriated to the University of Minnesota Center for Transportation Studies uh, cannot exceed $2 million in any fiscal year. This language just strikes that requirement um, and is effective July 1, 2023. Section eight is Senator Jasinski's bill, seven, Senate file 721, um, taken from the adopted delete everything. This is the maximum fees that a dealer can, uh, an auto dealer can set as part of their documentation fees. Section nine on page 128 is section two of the first engrossment to Senate file 2321, Senator Carlson's bill establishing safe road zones, which allows a local political subdivisions and local law enforcement and local road authorities to submit a local request uh, requesting the commissioner of public safety to designate a uh, segment of a road as a safe road zone, which allows access to certain safety measures. Um, this continues on into page 129 um, and provides um, in subdivision four that the commissioner of public safety must coordinate with local law enforcement to determine implementation of enhanced traffic enforcement once a safe road zone has been designated. 
the subdivision five of this provision for safe road zones requires the Commissioner of Transportation to maintain on their website safe road zone implementation, including the identification of requests for and designations of safe road zones, an overview of the safety measures and traffic enforcement activity, and a review of annual expenditures. Section 10 on page 129 uh, authorizes a local um, authorizes the Commissioner of Transportation to set a speed limit or either temporary or permanent upon request of the local authority uh, in a safe road zone. Section 11 is the is Senate file 1360, the slowdown or move over for a vehicle flashing its emergency lights. This was heard as a standalone provision um, by the Transportation Committee in February. Um, as Ms. Boyd mentioned, there is a safety campaign associated with this bill. Um, there, uh, I know the committee was concerned about potential changes of which lanes would apply, but there's no clarifying language to this, but I will note that in the different, uh, different paragraphs, there are um, the scenarios of moving down or slowing over are accounted for for the different combinations of lanes that exist on the road, whether it be a single lane, a double lane, or more than two lanes. Um, and that change was picked up as part of a delete everything amendment to Senate file 1360. Uh, 1360. Section 12 on page 130 um, is Senate file 1280, 1291, or no, 1281, I get them confused, 12, uh, 1281, which allows for the definition of um, legal blindness uh, as a qualifying condition to receive a parking permit, a disability parking permit. Um, this is a Senator Howe proposal that was heard by the Senate Transportation Committee a few weeks ago. Um, section 13 on page 131 is uh, clarifying language to the hands-free bill um, as part of Senator Carlson's overall traffic safety bill, Senate File 2321. Um, this is uh, a new effective date was established uh, at Council's discretion of August 1, 2023 and applies to violations committed on or after that date. Um, this uh, effective date is also added to Section 14, um, providing specifically that holding a wireless communication device with one or both hands is a violation of the hands-free law. Section, 130, uh, section 15 on page 133 is Senate File 1065, another Senator Jasinski bill um, that applies to um, the Commissioner of Transportation uh, issuing permits for a um, tow trucks who exceed the weight limit when towing a vehicle um, that is damaged or disabled. Um, this $300 fee um, is essentially uh, a provision that allows them to uh, move those uh, to exceed the late, both length and width limitations uh, provided for under the uh, tra traffic regulations chapter and weight, limitation, weight limitations chapter under uh, chapter 169. Um, and that also of, of, uh, exempts the weight re requirements under subdivision two uh, when it, the, the vehicle is moving with urgent uh, movement and moving the disabled vehicle to a place of repair or safekeeping. So the weight limits don't apply even in exigent circumstances. Uh, section 16 on page 133 is Senate file 111. This is a Senator Westrom provision that was heard in, um, at the beginning of February by the Transportation Committee. This provides for a restricted license for 15-year-olds who have a disabled relative. The 15-year-olds are limited to operating a vehicle for um, providing chores or you know, providing, uh, taking their relative to a, a medical appointment, and the, lim the license is limited to the operations of daytime hours between 5 a.m. and midnight and within a 40-mile radius of the relative's residence. Um, this section is effective July 1, 2024. Section 17 is the first um, piece that's been brought in from Senate File 2134, Senator Gustafson's bill authorizing teleconference drivers education. This bill was heard by the Senate, um, Senate Transportation Committee a few weeks ago and was not amended. So the unamended language has been brought in here starting on page 134, line 20. Section 18, beginning on page 136, uh, raises the fees for Real ID compliant or non-compliant driver's licenses, enhanced driver's licenses, instruction permits, enhanced instruction permits, provisional licenses, and duplicate cards, as well as Minnesota identification cards. This is a governor's, rec uh, a governor's recommendation. It's pulled from Senate file 1946, article three, section eight. Um, this 
this uh, bill was not heard by the Senate Transportation Committee, so it is a chair initiative, but it is also a governor's recommendation, uh, increasing the fees of driver's licenses, real ID compliant cards, and other uh, forms of identification. Section 19 is um, on page 137. This is the um, second piece of the race and eth ethnicity classification um, chair initiative slash governor's recommendation that allows the um, uh, voluntary uh, indication of an applicant's race or ethnicity on a driver's license or identification card application. Um, this begins um, for applications beginning on, af on or after January 1, 2024. Skipping ahead to page 139 on line 12. This is Senate file 1281. Um, this is another Senator Howe provision uh, um, that provides for an expansion of the veteran designation on driver's licenses. Um, it provides that a res retired member of the National Guard or reserve component of the United States Armed Forces is uh, uh, eligible for the uh, designation, veteran designation on their driver's license and provides clarifying language on page 134, 139, line 24 about the types of discharge papers that are allowed um, to prove that veteran status. Uh, this is unchanged from uh, when Senate file 1281 was heard by the Senate Transportation Committee and is effective August 1, 2023. Section 21 is the re reintegration license bill. That's Senate file 577. That was amended by uh, the A1 and the A3 amendment. This is a Senator McEwen proposal um, and was heard by the Transportation Committee at the beginning of February. Um, that is a pretty extensive provisions and goes through uh, Five, 577, <laughs> and it uh, goes all the way until page 142. Um, that is uh, unchanged from the uh, com committee's adoption or consideration of that bill. On page 145, section 22 is Senate file 10, uh, 2134, the program, uh, the statute authorizing teleconference drivers education. Um, that is unchanged from when the committee heard this bill. Uh, section 23 on page 143 is the greenhouse gas emissions benchmarks from Senate file 2790. Uh, that requires the Commissioner of Transportation to establish benchmarks uh, in the transportation sector for greenhouse gas emission reduction goals um, that are provided in um, section 216H02. Um, and the Commissioner must include in those benchmarks an establishment of a proportional emissions reduction performance target specification on a four year or more frequent basis and how are those are allocated across the transportation sector. Section 24 on page 144 incorporates um, the capacity expansion development project goals um, that are a part of Senate file 2790 into the statewide multimodal transportation plan. This was unchanged from when this committee heard Senate file 2790. Page 144, section 25 is Senate file 671, Senator Dibble's disadvantaged communities car sharing grant account uh, as described by Ms. Boyd when walking through the spreadsheet. Uh, this provides that the um, car sharing grant is uh, essentially administering grants to nonprofit organizations or car sharing operators to promote the growth of car sharing operations in disadvantaged communities. Grant proceeds can be used for capital and operational costs and they must be based in Minnesota and be either a nonprofit organization or a car sharing operator. Um, and this section is effective July 1, 2023. Section 26 on page 145 is Senate file 1132 as amended. Um, so the first engrossment, this is the electric vehicle infrastructure program. Uh, I'll remind members that we uh, made changes to um, subdivision four to add the installation certification requirements as required under federal rules and the prevailing wage requirement in paragraph B which picks up on page 146 beginning on line one and also the reporting requirement to the legislature on the, on the electric vehicle infrastructure program uh, beginning on page 146 lines five to 22. Section 27 on one, page 146 and section 28 on page 147 are, um, some re, uh, are some pieces of language from Senate file 671, the car sharing grant. Um, this provides for um, essentially the, the conforming changes that were proposed in the bill that allows the, the fee to essentially not, uh, basically those provisions have been unchanged from Senate file 671. Uh, on page 148, 
on section 29, um, this requires the Department of Public Safety to uh, submit a traffic safety report annually by January 2nd. This is a provision from Senate file 2321, the first engrossment. Section 30 is a chair initiative, um, this and also a governor's recommendation that um, there is a later repeal of the $50 fee for the registration of meteorological towers by the Department of Transportation. Um, the governor's recommendation was that the expense used to recover the fee was more than the, the proceeds from the fee. So the governor recommended that that uh, fee be repealed. And so that has been incorporated into uh, the omnibus transportation bill. Um, so section, section 30 is just a conforming change to that later repeal. Section 31 is Senate file 2983, uh, Senator Champion's bill authorizing a full service provider uh, in the nor North Minneapolis Service Center. So um, authorizing a deputy registrar to exist in that office turns that location into a full service center. Um, that bill was unamended, um, but heard by the Transportation Committee and passed to the floor. Section 32 is a new chair initiative, but also picked up in the governor's recommendations. Uh, this includes um, Senate file 2538 and Senate file 2753's ambitions um, to explore clean transportation fuel standards as well as a sustainable aviation fuel working group. So the working group has essentially a two-track purpose and, and involves the commissioners of the Pollution Control Agency, Transportation and Commerce to develop a clean transportation standard for transportation fuel supplied and used in Minnesota. And the task force must also uh, begin exploring the parameters of sustainable fuel aviation production um, piece in Minnesota. They also must work with aviation industry representatives to determine the production levels necessary to allow the aviation industry to meet their 2050 zero emission targets. Um, and they also must, uh, as heard in testimony for Senate file 2753, figure out the uh, emissions, uh, life cycle emissions production model uh, because there was some consideration and questions from committee members about what was the, the proper model. So the task force has to solve that problem and provide a recommendation and report to the legislature, which is picked up on page 150 in paragraph C. Uh, at the beginning, at the bottom of page 150 in section 33, this is section one of 1562, Senate file 1562. Um, that is the technical assistance grants. Um, the other two sections of Senate file 1562 were not picked up. So that is a change from what the committee heard. Um, 1562 was amended by the committee. Um, so there are some small technical changes that I didn't catch or flag in here, but um, essentially the commissioner of transportation has to establish a process to provide grants for technical assistance to requesting local units of government uh, and tribal governments and reserves a certain percentage of those proceeds um, uh, as, as allocated on page 152, beginning on lines one uh, through five. Um, so 15% must be reserved for tribal governments and not less than 15% 15 15 of available funding for townships and cities that are eligible for small assistance, cities assistance aid. Section 34 on page 152, is the legislative report about uh, automated speed enforcement. Um, this was amended by Senate file, uh, this was a amended provision in Senate file 2321. So it is the language from the first engrossment, but it is different from what the as introduced version was. If members would remember, there was a pilot program for speed enforcement that was authorized in 2321 that was taken out by amendment. So uh, we are just requiring a report by January 3, 2024. Uh, that would explore the kind of the barriers that still remain with spe speed safety cameras, including commercial driver's license issues, as well as um, data um, privacy issues. Um, section 35, beginning on page 153, is Senate file 777. That involves retroactive driver's license reinstatement. Um, so there are certain petty misdemeanors slash failure to appear um, provisions that have been repealed. So that is why there is a reference to Minnesota Statutes 2020. Um, but this allows for the Commissioner of Public Safety to, uh, not allows, per requires the Commissioner of Public Safety to uh, make an individual driver's license eligible for reinstatement if the license is solely suspended to those issues such as failure to appear convicted for very small, uh, not categorization small, but minor offenses that have been repealed uh, under Minnesota Statute. 
Section 36 on, on page 153 is another provision from Senate File 2321. That is the traffic safety violations disposition analysis. So that works with the Center for Transportation Studies to study um, traffic dispositions over the last five years um, for, to, to, evo to evaluate trends, the rates of citations issued, and um, the amount of times that courts uh, impose costs uh, of and fines uh, on, on drivers. And that report is required uh, a final report is required on January 1, 2025 to the legislature. Finally, section 37 is a repealer, so I'm gonna break them down paragraph by paragraph. Paragraph A repeals two sections of Minnesota statutes, the first of which is what Ms. Boyd said, uh, if you can remember, about um, the MnDOT Operations Center. Um, there was an amendment in 2021 session law that shifted that away from the Trunk Highway Fund into the general fund as an open appropriation. That um, has been just repealed. Um, that is 167.45. There will need to be a conforming change brought into a technical amendment, um, but that's not currently in this language. That would remove um, the operations of MnDOT's operation center um, in the definition of non-highway purposes, but that is not currently in this language in the A1 amendment. The second repealer statute in paragraph A of section 37 is the meteorological tower fee requirement, the $50 fee um, that was a governor's recommendation and a chair's initiative. Paragraph B are repeal, is repealer language that's unchanged from Senator Jasinski's Senate file 1065, the tow truck weight exemption bill. And paragraph C repeals rules governing teleconference driver's education and online adult only education. Um, for Senate file 2134 and again are unchanged. There are a few effective dates that have been brought in. So paragraph B is effective August 1, 2023, which is consistent with the permitting language. And paragraph C is, is effective July 1, 2023, which is also consistent with when the program for teleconference driver's education is authorized. I think that is everything in article, article eight and um, the rest is, of the bill is just a title. Whew. Thank you, Mr. Greatfield and Ms. Foy. Uh, uh, Chair Dibble, what is your preference? Do you want to say a few words, or should we? It looks like we have a little time for member discussion. Um, yes, I was going to mention just a couple of things quickly. Um, uh, oh, Senator Jasinski and I are going to work on some language. Um, hopefully, we'll have something in time by Monday that, that's responsive to some of the recommendations of the Southwest LRT uh, Legislative Auditor's Report. Um, I know that um, there is a proposal of Senator Fate's around electric bike rebates. Um, so that's out there. We'll hear that and consider it as a committee and decide if we support that. Also, um, kind of a, a large item that I want to um, let the committee know as well as the public, especially the railroads and those who are interested in railroad safety. Senator Kupek has a Senate file 3187, um, which has just been introduced. It's an initiative actually of the majority leaders, um, which um, will bring Senator Kupek forward to talk about the provisions of that bill and decide as a committee whether or not to include those in this package. And so we'll do that on Friday as well. Um, I wanted to just acknowledge flag early. There's a couple of proposals around metropolitan governance. They don't look like they're super compatible. Um, they're two different ideas, and we'll figure out if how to make them compatible, or you know how to how to figure out which direction to go on that question. Um, uh, is there anything, Mr. Greenfield, that I'm forgetting? Mr. Greenfield, that we can forecast. I, I believe you covered, Senator Dibble, I believe you covered um, most of the things that have been discussed uh, in terms of overall packages. There will be um, a proposal from Senator Herr concerning deputy registrars, um, but uh, I, I don't believe that there's anything further that, um, in terms of as introduced language, that, we, that will be carried forward and, and proposed to the committee. Um, as a possible amendment to the underlying uh, delete everything uh, slash omnibus bill. Great. All right. So Senator I'm Dibble. happy to respond to questions or, or happy for Ms. Boyd and Mr. Greenfield to respond to questions at this point. Um, and also, um, you know, I will make myself 
um, to members as well as the public as available as I possibly can as we move towards testimony on Friday and, and markup on Monday. Members, questions? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Dibble. Thank you for bringing the bill forward. Obviously, there's some concerns I have and there's some things I like in it, though. So there is some good and some bad from my point of view. Uh, one thing a little bit concerning is the retail delivery fee. Uh, it's a bill that we never heard here. I know it was heard in the House, but we never heard it here. So a little frustrated we didn't take public input here in the Senate and it's in the bill. Um, but I know that does happen. There are obviously chairs initiatives in there, but we didn't hear that to my knowledge or I missed that day. Um, and then uh, active transportation plan, that was one that wasn't done this year as well. It was done previous years. I guess I've only been around for six years, but I haven't seen that's the normal that we put a bill in that hasn't been heard this year or in this body. Um, online driver's training, a little frustrated that that is not there. The uh, uh, one that we had put in there, because I think with a uh, new driver's license, we need both of those. Um, but again, overall, obviously some concerns. Um, but I do appreciate some of the bills you included from our caucus, so that is much appreciated, and you've been working well with us, so I want to thank you for that. But I'll be some concerns. I think um, rural Minnesota is at a slight disadvantage in this bill uh, for some of the funding and, and some of the things going on there. And then obviously with the new clean car and clean energy, there's some concerns of what those costs are going to do to our residents. But uh, happy to work with you through the bill, and again, a, a much appreciated working with you. Uh, through the process, but again, obviously some concerns uh, from our caucus. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Um, so thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Dzinski. Um Yes, I acknowledge we hadn't heard the delivery fee. That's why I'm allowing for a lot of time, more time than, than most chairs allow for in terms of rollout, testimony, and, and markup, you know, and we're pausing over the course of an entire weekend. Um, so, um, so we, you know, these issues will be fully vetted and, and, and fully heard. We can talk more about uh, online. I'm interested in your perspective on uh, rural Minnesota because that's not the intent. And so, you know, show me where where you feel like um, it tilts um, over to the disadvantage because I think we actually do pretty well in here by local roads and rural roads and county state aid highways and the like. So, um, you know, if there's a way, if if it is off kilter and out of balance, I'm very always very proud of my bills being really really balanced. So if it's not, I want to know how that how that analysis works and will. We'll work with that. Members, other questions? All right. Um, Ms. Hethier, do you have, did you want to give us a preview? Thank you, Madam Chair. Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., we will be meeting in room 1150 in the Senate building, and that's where we'll be having public testimony on this bill. And as uh, the chair mentioned, we'll also be hearing Senator Kupek's bill, which was just introduced today. And then on Monday, we will meet in our regular time, 3 p.m. in this room, and that will be for amendments and markup by the committee. And with that, members, we are adjourned. Oh, Senator Howe. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I take it Friday will be uh, a hybrid meeting also? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Howe, yes, there will be a hybrid option for uh, committee members to participate. Oh. <laughs> Senator Dibble. A couple more things. Um, you know, we you know obviously there's no earmarks in this bill at this point. Everyone knows how I feel about earmarks. That being said, sometimes we work with the agency. We try to figure things out. Um, so don't get too panicky at this point on that subject. And we are going to hear all the member request bills. So that that's going to happen um, in plenty of time to you know to to figure all of that out. So so don't don't worry about that quite yet. And I think Madam Chair, before we adjourn, we do have to um, lay the bill on the table. Uh, Mr. Chair, excellent point. With that, we will lay um, Senate File 3157 as amended on the table. And with that, we are adjourned.